So what have we learned from gravity wave astronomy so far? I mean, to my mind, the really big thing we've learned is that black holes exist. I mean, before that, we knew they were very dense, very small, compact, darkish things, which certainly sounded like a black hole. We couldn't think of anything else with those properties that wasn't a black hole. General relativity said it had to be a black hole, but general relativity had never been tested under those sort of awesome gravitational fields, anything close to it. So we didn't really know. So I will say, lack of imagination does not constitute proof. Just because we couldn't imagine anything else with those properties doesn't mean there isn't anything out there. The universe has surprised us many, many times in the past. But now I think I'm getting convinced. I mean, you really now are tracing these objects as they get closer and closer, right until the merger, when I mean, they're traveling at the best part of the speed of light, only a Schwarzschild radius apart. And general relativity has passed all those tests with flying colors. So I think it's now getting pretty secure that black holes really exist. We've learned a lot more things about the fact there are so many massive black holes in the universe, which we weren't really expecting. We can also use, learn about the binary neutron star, as we talked about in the first course in the series. And we can also use these things to measure the Hubble constant, as we'll talk about in the cosmology course. But that's where we're at now. What's the future? In some fields, you get the first detection that's really exciting, and then things ease off after that. Is that going to be the case here? Or is there a future to gravity wave astronomy? Where's it going to go next? Well, LIGO and Virgo and the other current gravity wave detectors are going to improve quite drastically over the next few years. There's a long list of improvements that are going to be made. They're going to have frequency-dependent quantum squeezing to suppress radiation pressure, active wavefront control to stop heating of mirrors by deforming the, me deforming the beams, new mirror coatings, and so on. And all this is going to at least double the range of these things, so they'll see more events and get better quality data on the ones they do see. Looking further forward, there's a proposal called Voyager, where they would actually change the laser to work at an infrared wavelength that have different test masses that operate at a much higher laser power, once again improving the efficiency, reducing the noise, and allowing them to see further away gravity wave events and get better data on the ones they can see. And even further in the future, they might be looking at building new things, replacing LIGO, not just by putting new detectors at the end, but actually building new tubes. There are proposals called Einstein and Cosmic Explorer, which might have longer arms, maybe 20 kilometers long, maybe 40 kilometers long, not just four. Cryogenic cooling, possibly underground. These could detect black hole mergers out to redshift 20, which is practically every black hole that's ever going to merge in the universe would be seen. And neutron star mergers out to redshift 2. Hundreds of thousands of events will be detected per year. It's all very exciting, though, on a long time scale and requiring lots of money. But that's by no means the whole picture. We've just opened a new spectrum, the gravity wave spectrum. We know the electromagnetic spectrum. We've exploited it all the way from gamma rays through to radio waves, and every time we've looked at the new part of the spectrum, we discovered new things. There's an enormous spectrum for gravity waves as well. Now here is a diagram showing the strain, that's the fractional change in the length caused when a gravity wave comes through, against the frequency. And here is advanced LIGO, that's the current version of LIGO, and it's got its peak efficiency, as we saw earlier, at about 100 hertz, 100 cycles per second. And the efficiency gets less at higher or lower frequencies. And it's mostly detecting chirps, those last few seconds when... Um, solar mass or 10 solar mass black holes or neutron stars start merging. Because so that has about the right frequency, hundreds per second. But there's a lot more spectrum out there, and a lot of different interesting things that could be detected. And of course, physicists and astronomers are thinking, how can we measure different frequencies? The next frequency range is about 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 hertz, so uh, one cycle every 100 seconds, or every 10,000 seconds. And this would be addressed by a pr proposal called LISA. LISA stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And the basic idea is, look, looking at a fractional strain, uh, 
which is very small, but the longer the arm you can have, if it's one part in a million, 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 and you make your arm a million, million, million times longer, that's going to certainly help you measure the whole change. So the idea is that we would have three floating satellites out in space, very long distances apart, that would fire laser beams at each other and use these laser beams to measure very precisely their relative distance. And then as the gravity waves come through, it would cause distortions in these distances and hence be able to pick up these low frequency gravity waves. Now you won't be able to measure the distances as precisely with a spacecraft like this as you can with uh, advanced LIGO on Earth, but you can have a baseline very, very, very much longer than four kilometers, so you still get extremely good sensitivity. And because your length is much longer, you can pick up these lower frequency gravity waves. Here's the orbit they're proposing for this. The th three spacecraft would follow the Earth in its orbit around the Sun and keep in a perpetual triangle around each other. Now this would be a formidable technical challenge to build these things and allow them to hold their formation flying. But they did a recent Pathfinder mission that seemed to suggest they can actually get the noise and the properties they need to make this actually work. So it does look feasible. When will it happen? Well, at the moment it's in the long-term roadmap for the European Space Agency for sometime in the 2030s, so it's still more than 10 years away. What would you discover with something like this? Well, one thing you're going to pick up is when you get compact objects, the same sort of things that LIGO is picking up, the merging neutron stars or black holes, LIGO can only pick up the last few moments when they're spiralling together to their doom. Something like LISA could pick up their routine motion like months or years before, and all they're doing is just rotating happily around each other, only getting closer together very, very slowly. And that will produce basically a oscillating gravity wave signal at a particular frequency. And LISA will be able to pick that up for pretty much every binary in the Milky Way galaxy and many way beyond that. So you'll be able to get a complete census of all the compact binaries of out there purely on gravity waves. There are also the very massive black holes, the ones that form quasars, the you know, million or ten million or a hundred million solar mass black holes. And LISA will be able to pick up the chirps when they come together, which are again at much lower frequency and pick them up anywhere in the universe. So anytime some of these massive black holes merge, if indeed they do merge, and they probably have to to get the black holes that big in the first place, you'd see them anywhere in the universe. So that'd be pretty exciting. At lower frequencies still, in principle, you can do it with existing radio telescopes. These are called pulsar timing arrays. The basic idea is you use ground-based telescopes like this one at, at Parks in New South Wales, Australia, and measure very precisely the distance between the Earth and a whole bunch of pulsars. And the pulsars are, of course, incredibly regular clocks. And so if you measure the distance to all sorts of pulsars all over the sky with enough precision, you'd use millisecond pulsars, the ones that spin really fast and really stably because they're extremely good clocks. Therefore, you can get the very high level of accuracy. And then when a really low frequency gravity wave comes through, it'll shift the entire Earth one way or the other and cause the pulsars in one distance, one direction to appear closer and those at right angles to appear further away. This will be picking up the routine orbits of really massive black holes. So again, we're talking about things like quasars, the ones in the middle of giant galaxies. We said that LISA, the space interferometer, would pick up then when they merge, the chirps at the end of their life. In principle, the pulsar timing array could pick up their routine orbits months, years, decades before they finally merge. Now, the first of these pulsar timing arrays set up in parks in 2004, so they've been running for a long time, very closely monitoring pulsars. They've discovered many, many interesting things about pulsars, and in fact, fast radio bursts came as a side effect of some of these measurements. But not yet any gravity waves. At the moment, the telescopes just aren't quite reaching the level of precision they require. But maybe with more time, better detectors, they can start doing it. The real progress will come from the next generation of radio telescopes, which is the so-called square kilometre array. So the square kilometre array is a proposed 
very, very large collecting area of a square kilometre array built in two parts, a low frequency part, which is in outback Western Australia, which you can see in this artist's impression here. There's lots of low frequency dipoles, which are measuring the signal, and you have fields of them collected by fibre optic cables spread over large amounts of outback Australia. And a medium frequency system, which once again, consists of large numbers of antenna. This time, these are actual wide-angle dishes spread over a large flat bit of desert in South Africa, in the Karoo. So with the enormous collecting area and sensitivity of these, you can probably make the pulsar timing arrays work and use them to measure the extremely low frequency gravity waves from just massive black holes in the middle of galaxies orbiting each other. So. There's a long way to go with gravity wave astronomy yet. When we next revise this course in another five years, we might well have more to say.